Can I get y'all to do me a favor? So, I, I, God gave me a vision during praise and worship this morning. So I would like everybody that is able to come up here and kneel down at the altar. We're going to be a little interactive this morning. See, Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We were not just created to worship. We were created to live right here. Our entire lives, we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. We are called to live on the altar as an act of worship to God. In every area of your life, this is where it is. We do altar calls every week, but this is where God calls us to live. to surrender what we are to his will. And I'm not going to make you all stay up here, but as we go throughout today's message, I want you just to remember this sight and being up here because some of you up here now have never come to the altar before. Some of you up here have come to the altar a lot, but God's calling us right there to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, to live on that altar that was created to worship him. Amen? Amen. Amen. You guys can, you guys can be seated, but I just, I had to do that. God showed that to me during worship and I can't get it out of my mind. And it's my prayer moving forward that you can't either. Created to worship. That's what God created us to do. I'm going to ask you guys to turn to Psalms chapter 95. We're going to, we're going to read a couple of, of scriptures out of there. We're going to talk for a little bit, and I'm going to share the message that God has given me to give to you all this morning. But um, Psalm 95 is where we're going to start. And if you guys would stand as we, uh, once you have it, Psalm 95. It says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. God, I come to you now, and I just pray, Father God, that your word would go forth this morning. 
I pray, Lord Jesus, that I would be the first hearer of your word, and I pray, God, that your message would flow freely this morning and that everybody would receive it, Father God. I thank you and I praise you and I just give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So y'all may be seated, but the, the first point that I have for you guys is very simple. We need to acknowledge that we were created to worship our Creator. And I, I, we're going to get into we're going to get into worship a lot. But the one thing that I need to remind you, or the one thing that I want you all to get out of this, is worship is not four songs on Sunday morning. I am not taking anything away from the worship team. But worship is not four songs on Sunday morning. And I think a lot of times we have gotten into a mentality of that that is our worship time. That time is the the dessert, the cherry on top of our lifestyle of worship. And once we learn to embrace that lifestyle of worship, once we learn to live at the altar, we find that a lot of the cares of this world, a lot of the things that consume our minds can just float away. We don't have to carry those burdens. We just simply need to worship our Creator. We need to recognize that He is our divine Creator. We must must take take a look at creation. You know, I... (laughs) People, people say all the time that it takes a lot of faith to believe in something you can't see. It takes more faith for, it would take more faith for me to believe it all happened by accident. Well, you want to talk about the laws of probability, let's get scientific about it for a second. I have a better chance of going to Vegas and pulling the handle on a slot machine and winning the jackpot on the first pull then going to the next machine and pulling the handle and winning the jackpot. Going to the next machine, pulling the handle and winning the jackpot. And going to a thousand more machines, pulling the handle and winning the jackpot on every single pull than I do of this just all accidentally happening. You wanna talk about faith, those people got some faith. Like I need to have atheist faith. That sounds bad, but y'all know what I mean, right? Don't take the sound bite or take that one out of context. (laughs) But I believe that it takes more faith to believe that it's all an accident than because when we look around and we look at the beauty and the complexity of the world that we live in, how could we possibly say that it wasn't designed? How could we possibly say that that was an accident? Just look at the flowers in a field. The the colors that we have, the, the trees, and even if we just take a look at the complexity of people. You know, we we violate the first law of thermodynamics. You know, everything seeks its lowest form. Well, tell me how you get to the lowest form by becoming more and more complex. That's not how it works. When we look at the world around us, it is, it is so easy to remember that there's a creator, but it is so often overlooked. We tend to stop focusing on the beauty of the small things because we're looking for the quote unquote, the big miracle. If we only focus on the big miracle, we miss the millions of miracles that occur each and every single day. Each and every single one of us woke up this morning. That's miracle number one. Assuming we all woke up in a bed, that's miracle number two. You know, we have to focus not just on the big, because when we focus only on the big miracles, then it destroys our faith. But when we learn to live a lifestyle of worship, 
And then we start to notice all the little miracles. All those little miracles just continue to build and build and build your faith. We need to understand that God is our source and our sustainer. And here's, here's where I got to step on my toes. When we fail to worship the divine, we will worship the profane. We are created to worship. We're going to worship. No matter what happens in our lives, no matter what's going on, no matter what we see in front of us, at some point we are going to worship something. We were created to do it. You look at animals. Animals are created for certain reasons. You know, you have, you know, a predator is designed to be a predator. At the end of the day, we don't go look at a fox and be like, hey, why'd you kill that rabbit? That's what it's supposed to do. So how can we look at somebody that's stuck on pornography and be like, hey, why are you worshiping that? Because they haven't found the right thing to worship. We can't look at the person that worships money and say, hey, why do you worship money? They were created to. They just misplaced that worship. Misplaced worship is probably the easiest way that Satan can pull us away from God's hand of protection. Because I'll tell you what, it is really, really easy to worship something that you are not expecting anything from. See, we worship God, but we, we worship God with expectation. And that's not misplaced. We expect God to do what he said he would do in his word. That's our expectation when we worship. We expect that God's going to do what he said he would do, but then what happens the second something happens that we didn't expect? The second something happens where we get an answer to prayer that we didn't want. What happens? Our expectations are no longer met. Even though he's still doing it, just he's not doing it in the way that we wanted him to, so now that takes and it, it starts to take away our worship. Well, I can worship cash. See, because I don't expect anything from money. If I have it, I can spend it. If I don't have it, I can't. I can get another credit card. I can run that one up. I can get another one. I can run that one up. I can worship things. I can worship cars. I can worship houses. I can worship all kinds of things. And it's real easy to worship something when you have no expectations on it. Because those other things that people tend to worship can't let them down. But I'll tell you what, it can't fill you up either. There's no fulfillment. All that's left after worshiping the profane is an emptiness. You will never get filled. That's why people that worship those things need more and more and more and more and more. Because they're trying to get filled up by something that has no substance. You can't be filled by empty vessels. And yeah, I'm talking about people now too. Because a lot of people, they tend to put their worship and they assign somebody. Whether it's that friend that they've had since they were the... Well, I've been friends with him my whole life. You know, I'm not going to break off that friendship. You can't be filled by an empty vessel. When we worship people over God, people are going to let us down. I don't know how many times, and I've seen it so many times where, especially like when it happens with the church leader. The church leaders stumble or get caught up in sin, and everybody's like, I can't believe that person sinned. He's a human. 
He's a person. We've got flesh. The only way that you can't believe somebody's sin is if you put them on a pedestal to worship. When you idolize somebody, that's when you lose the ability to recognize that person as a human being that has a tendency towards sin. When I see a leader fall, my first thought is, man, people weren't praying hard enough for that person. When when people take and turn their prayers for somebody's strength and turn it into worshiping that person, that's inviting the enemy to come in. Because when we put people above God, God can show us real quick that people can be knocked down. See, the nature of worship is simple. We're, we're in, a, we're in a, um, a discussion on nature versus nurture, right? Okay, so it is human nature to worship. But you have to nurture your worship to make sure it's pointed in the right direction. I'll say it again. It is human nature to worship. But you have to nurture it so it is in the right direction. What's the right direction? There's only one. Okay, let's be absolutely clear. The only thing we should worship is God. One. But that doesn't happen automatically. See, Worship involves expressing reverence, love, and devotion to God. It it involves embracing a heart of gratitude and humility in every single aspect of your life. See, that's why when I had you all come up here and I said, we're called to live at the altar. If we're not living at the altar, then we are not living in a place of worship. The scripture says to present your body as a living sacrifice, which means as long as you are living, present your body at the altar. As long as you have breath in your lungs, use that breath to worship him in every area of your life. When you go to work, how many of y'all go to work and You see that person that gets under your skin in a little bit, and the first thing you think, that living sacrifice. You got to sacrifice that part that gives you that negative feeling. I'm talking to me, too. Don't think I'm standing up here going, I'm good. I am not. The thing that God has been challenging me with the most over the past several years is learning to get into a mindset of continuous worship. And it's not easy. It is not, especially at work. (laughs) You know, everybody has their place that gets them in their flesh real quick. I got more than one. Some of us have more than one, okay? I'm going to let you know right now, work is tough. And there's times where, yeah, I need to put both headphones in, but there's also times where I need to put both headphones in and remove myself from situations. Let me tell you, when I'm driving, when I'm driving, that's another place where I tend to forget to be in an attitude of worship. Even when I got worship music playing, I could be in my truck, I could be driving down the road, I could be praising God, I could be worshiping, I could be yeah, doing everything I was supposed to do, let one person cut me off. I am instantly out of my altar. Let somebody else cut me off or then someone else come in and start driving real slow in front of me. Now I'm speaking in tongues too. (laughs) 
Not the right kind of tongues, but I'm speaking in tongues. Practicing sign language. See, some of y'all laughing, but y'all, y'all know. But do you see how easy it is to get pulled straight out of that mindset? We, we have a tendency to lay all our stuff at the altar in prayer. And then as soon as that prayer is over, we get a couple steps away from the altar, we go, you know, I kind of like that one. And we reach around and we... We grab that one and put it back in our pocket. I might need that one later. Whew, I almost left all my anger at the altar. What would I do if somebody cut me off if I don't like take just a little bit of it back? How am I going to make it through the day if I can't yell at people at work? I can't, I can't give up all my pride. I got to keep a little bit of that pride in my pocket just in case I need it, right? And then Satan will present you with every situation necessary to water that seed of pride until it consumes you all over again. See, worship is a relationship. Worship fosters deep personal relationship with God, but only true worship can do that. If, if the four songs on Sunday morning is your definition of worship, you will never get that deep personal relationship with God that he has called you to get. That worship on Sunday mornings is to usher in the Holy Spirit so that everybody can be free to worship. And that doesn't just mean free to worship on Sunday mornings. It means free to worship. When you no longer care about what's going on around you and you just seek God's face. Best example I can think of in the Bible is David. David did not care what was going on around him. He wanted to get God's heart. And he did what it took. And he left all his abandonment. And he just went for God and did not care what anybody thought. How many times do we get into a spirit of worship and we're looking around to see if anybody's looking at us or what people are thinking of us? How many of y'all have ever been at work and a song catch you while you're listening to it? You're raising your hands at work and then you have to stop yourself and go, wait, did anybody just see me do that? I don't care. Because I'll tell you what, that worship is what's going to get me through the day. That worship is going to give me the ability to lead my team the way that God wants me to lead my team. I can't worship that paycheck because you know what? That paycheck's not going to fill me up. You know what? If I worship my paycheck, then I need to worship Uncle Sam too because he's already taken 30% of it off the top. You know, I get up here and I talk about tithes every week and I keep trying to say tithing is not about money. Well, one of the main reasons we tithe is so that we don't worship that money. Because I'm going to tell you what, there's two things, two things that people put above God almost constantly and that they're the hardest two things to stop doing, to stop putting God above, that's sex and money. When you look around and what people struggle with outside of any type of spiritual relationship, it deals with one of those two things. Because those two things people think that they can get fulfillment from, but there is no fulfillment in empty acts. We have got to learn to get that fulfillment from God, and that only comes through the relationship that we get when we worship Him, it's about knowing God intimately and experiencing His presence. 
That's what gives us the fulfillment. That's when we know that we have that worship. That's when we know that we're doing and we're, we're worshiping God the way that we were created to because it feels good. All those other things feel good too, but it's temporary. But that worship, that experience that you get when you're at that altar, that experience that you get, how many of y'all have ever done an extended fast? Okay, we got a few people. Those of us that came from Bethel, we had those, uh, those 21-day deals every year. <laughs> but how many of y'all just crave that closeness that you have with God at the, towards the end of those long fasts? It's like, man, you feel so close to God, you feel like you can sit there and just have a conversation with him, high five and go about your day and know that he's walking right there beside you. That is not just supposed to be a fasting experience. That is supposed to be how we live our lives. We should be able to experience that closeness with God at all times, 24-7. We were created In such a way, what does the Bible say in Genesis? It says that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. He had conversation, relationship 100% of the time because that's what he was created to do. That's what we were created to do, but it doesn't happen if we don't live a lifestyle of worship. If we don't live at this altar, then we have to find other things to get that fulfillment, and we have to keep trying and trying and trying because they'll never fill us up. See, worshiping fulfills our purpose. When your purpose is being fulfilled, you have that sense of accomplishment, that sense of pride that no one can take away from you. You know, we, Pastor Herman and I, we talk all the time, you know, we're talking about testimonies and the power of your testimony. And I keep saying, you know, anybody can argue Scripture, but nobody can argue with what God's done in your life. You can say, well, if God said this in one chapter and this in a... You know what? When I say God delivered me from anger, there is not a person on this planet that can look at me and say, no, he didn't. You did that yourself. (laughs) If I did that myself, you'd still see a really angry person. I would just be hiding it better. If I had the ability to heal myself, hmm, that's a self-worship thing. You know, there was this, this person that worshipped himself above God. He has a new name now. See, because he was created to worship God too. He was a worship leader. He fell from heaven just as fast. See, our ultimate purpose in this life is to bring glory to God through worship. Yeah, God tells us in the Great Commission that we're to go and make disciples, and there's a lot of things that God calls us to do and a lot of things that God commands us to do, and God gives some of us purposes and some of us plans. But I'm going to tell you, every single purpose and plan that God has for your entire life is going to be rooted in worship. When we align ourselves with God's will, it's when we can find our purpose. If you don't know what your purpose is yet, keep worshiping. Dig in. Get those roots deep in worship, and God will reveal it to you through your worship. See, we need to become vessels of his love and grace to the world. And when we learn to become those vessels... When we let him fill us up, then we have plenty to pour out to other people. But how many of y'all know on Sunday mornings there's a lot of empty vessels talking? And a lot of empty vessels thinking they're being filled up by that empty vessel. And I hate to, I hate to pick on the church, but I got to be real. I got to be real. And I know some of y'all have done it. You've gone to a church and you heard the message and you heard the pastor and you, you sat there through the service and you go, you know, I felt nothing. Could not feel the spirit move at all in that church. It's empty vessels trying to fill empty vessels. 
So we have a call to action in this. We need to encourage one another to live a life of continuous worship. See, we got to we got to pray for our leaders. we got to pray for each other. we got to each live at this altar so that we can put aside our flesh and do what God has called us to do. We need to be in daily prayer. Again, going back, four songs on Sunday morning is the dessert, not the experience. To get that as dessert, we have to spend time with God. We have to seek that intimacy with God. Think of, think of the person that you know. There's, everybody in here has a person that knows them better than anyone else. That knows everything they struggle with, that knows everything that's going on. God is supposed to be closer to you than that person. In addition to that daily prayer, we need to have acts of service and love towards one another. And I'm going to tell you, that's the hard one for me. It is very easy for me to love the people that I like. It is very easy for me to love all of you guys here in the church and love my family. And man, sometimes I forget about that L word the second I clock in. I get to work at 5 o'clock. Sometimes there's already people standing at my desk waiting for me. I do not walk up to my desk thinking, man, I love these people. It's different thoughts. But I got to show them just as much love and compassion as God shows me. And I'm going to tell you, that's hard. That's hard. But we got to share the message of God's love with those around us. That doesn't just mean we got to preach at them. When I see that person standing at my desk at 5 o'clock in the morning, and my first thought is, is walking up to that person with a smile saying, what can I help you with today? That may not sound like much, but I'm going to tell you what, it's an act of worship. It shows that person that you care about that person. If I just walked up and be like, you know what? God told me to tell you to get away from my desk until I've had my first cup of coffee. (laughs) That is not sharing the love. It is being selfless. Remember, living sacrifice. Sacrifice being the key word there. Putting aside that flesh, putting aside the tendencies that we would normally have, putting aside the the personality conflict or the dislike of the person to say, you know what, I'm here to serve you. What can I do for you? And you know what? That's ten times harder now that I'm actually a manager. Because before, I could just say, go talk to the boss. You don't need to be at my desk, go talk to the boss. That was my way of getting rid of people. Well, I don't have the exact answer to your question, but I know who does, go talk to them. And now it's, I don't have the exact answer to your question, let me go find out and I'll get back with you. See, it's a difference. I got to be real, though. I'm not always happy about it. I don't always have a smile on my face when I'm sacrificing in those ways, especially when it's with people that I disagree with or a task that I despise doing. I don't always get it right. But I'm trying. It's, it's, It's hard to not look at the altar and want to pick stuff back up. Because I'm going to tell you what, some of those things that we pick back up are defense mechanisms. Man, we love defense mechanisms as people, don't we? You know, I was, I was very insecure when I was in high school, so I always tried to be the funny guy. 
And the best way to be the funny guy is self-deprecation. I just make fun of myself. People would laugh. After a while, you start to believe the stuff you start saying about yourself. We've got to leave that stuff at the altar because when we pick it back up, we're taking away the space that God has for what his fix is. His fixes are permanent. So what do we need to do? What is our goal? When we leave out of here, what is our purpose? When we leave out of here, our purpose is simple. Leave the garbage at the altar and move forward and have everything we do be an act of worship. To live that lifestyle of living at the altar. We were created to do this. It's going to come naturally, but we need to nurture what it is. See, there's a, another scripture, and it says this. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. And the more we learn to think on those things, the more we learn to nurture our worship so that it goes in the right direction. Amen? I'm done. Pastor Herman, it's all yours. We got one right here for you, too. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, worship is not a spectator sport. You can't get anything out of worship. Well, actually you can when you watch somebody else do it, but you get the maximum benefits when you get involved in it. And I want to say this before we give the altar call, we need each other when we worship. If I can be honest with you, I've been going at half pace over, over the last almost three weeks. I've had a massive migraine. It's like I couldn't shake it. It's, it's been hard to shake it for the last two and a half, three weeks. And, um, but how many of you know just being around the saints, though, in worship helps? I don't know what you got going on or what's going on, but living a lifestyle of worship is paramount to anything that you can ever possibly do. Living a lifestyle of worship with other believers, living a lifestyle of worship yourself is crucial to everything that you can possibly do. And so I want to invite you into that worship, to that lifestyle. So whether you're online or whether you're in person, if there's an area in your life where you know you need to develop this lifestyle of worship, I want you to slip up your hands. Or maybe you're interceding for somebody else to get this lifestyle of worship, to get this to worship, to worship, to worship. I don't think you caught what Minister Pringle was saying. He says, 
that we were created to worship. And you're going to worship something. Since you're going to worship. Anyway, why not worship the right thing? Why not get your worship in order? It's an awesome thing. I was watching the tennis match yesterday, and I was watching the two young ladies. And I was watching. And one of the things that you can tell when it's in you, because it's one of the first things that comes out. When you're squeezed, whatever's on the inside of you comes out. I've been surprised at some of the things that come out of me when I get squeezed, but I'm working on that. If there's an area in your life where you need prayer, just slip up your hands. There's one. Can you come, if you don't mind? I keep thinking of this song. Any one of y'all can. The name of the song is, you don't have to play it, but if you get a chance, I want you to listen to it. It says, to worship you I live. Does anybody remember that song? Brother Israel, he said, to worship you I live. I live to worship you. What we do here is celebration of worship when we worship God. I want us to get into an act, get into a habit of just telling God who he is and just worshiping, letting our lifestyle line up with the things of God. I'm telling you, something happens when you worship the Lord. I tell that story all the time. I tell it so much that people get sick of me telling it. And I told it this morning because somebody was talking about worship. And I told him it was the, the way I was able to find sleep. I don't know what you find when you come into the presence of the Lord, when you worship, when you come in God's people's presence, when you worship God, whenever you get into the things of God, whenever you, but you find, I didn't even, I realized I didn't even know myself until I begin to worship, until I begin to call upon the name of the Lord. So it is with you. People may ask the question, why do you go to church? Or why do you pray? Or why do you worship? Or why do you sing? Or why do you live that way? And if the truth be told, for some of us, it was the only thing we had. I dare you to strengthen your lifestyle of worship. When he told me that, when Minister Pringle was talking, he told me that last week. He said, um, you can either worship God or worship the profane. In other words, what you're doing is you're worshiping stuff that don't even matter. Worshiping people that don't even matter. Running after somebody who don't know where they're going. But how many of you know God has a plan for you. He has a plan for the things. And you were created to worship. You were created to introduce others to worship. That's why we're here. Father, we thank you. We adore you. We lift you high. Can y'all forgive me? I'm not practicing worship. I just thought about it. Because scripture says, if there's any one of you sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them lay hands. I know I'm the pastor, but I'm not exempt from that. 
I just told you that I have a headache and I had it for almost three weeks. I've been carrying a burden that maybe it wasn't meant for me to carry. I done been to the emergency room, I done been everywhere. But I didn't ask y'all to pray for me yet. <laughs> so if y'all don't mind, I'm gonna come down. I'm gonna hand help co-pastor somebody the mic. And can y'all pray, pray for my head? Um, I'm not exempt from this thing. So if some of y'all can come on up. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Anyone else that needs prayer? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you all so much for for praying and for being obedient and trusting and believing God in spite of what's going on. I, I know there's a lot of churches who you won't see the pastor asking for prayer. Hmm. But I thank God that we have a pastor who he loves God enough. I 
thank God that we have ministers in the church who love God enough. God, I thank you. God, we're not perfect. And we don't always get things right, Father God. But this message is such a reminder that we live at the altar, that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable unto you, God. God, we thank you for your continuous grace, your continuous mercy, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that you give us an opportunity, like Minister Tom said, we have an opportunity to come together to celebrate you, to celebrate how we've lived for you throughout the week, God. We have this opportunity to come to worship you together, God and celebration of who you are, Lord God. Thank you, God, for the opportunity, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for constantly getting us right, God, constantly getting our hearts right, God, constantly getting our minds right, God, constantly bringing us into order with you, God. God, I pray even for Minister Tom right now. If you all can lay hands on Minister Tom, I know that um, um, we've been praying for him, but if you all can lay hands on Minister Tom right now, Father, we just ask, Lord God, that you fill him up, Lord God, because you've poured into him, Father God, and he's poured out, Father God, even in the midst of such an environment and such a hard atmosphere, God, he ministered today, Lord God. He broke through some places, oh God. I pray, God, that you fill him back up again, Lord God. Fill him up so much, oh God, that he even overflows, Lord God, as he expressed how he deals with things on his job. Lord God, fill him up. Father God, of you, fill him up with your presence, oh God. Fill him up with your word, Father God. Fill him up, oh God, as he may be on empty from pouring out on today, Lord God. I pray now, oh God, that you, God, pour yourself into him even right now, God. I pray that rivers of living water would flow, oh God, over his body, in his body, through his body, Father God. I plead the blood of Jesus over and around him and through him, Lord God. We we pray, oh God, that your healing balm of Gilead, oh God, that you would be his healer, even over his hip, Father God, even over the joints, oh God, even over the tissue, oh God, even over the cartilage, oh God. Oh, Father God, I pray, Lord, for supernatural healing, oh God, in his hip socket, even right now, Lord God. I understand and I know, God, that there were things that happened in his body that has got it all out of whack and all out of sorts. Oh God, it was pulled and pushed and um, all kinds of things happened, oh God. But I pray right now, Father God, that you would snap things back in place. We pray healing over him now, Lord God. Oh I pray that the fire of the Lord would come, God. I pray that you would come, Lord God, and that you would heal his body, Lord God, that you would burn up every impurity, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray, Lord God, for healing over his body right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray for supernatural healing to take place in his body, Lord. I know that we have been praying, oh God. I know we have been seeking you over his body, Father God. Oh, Lord God, but I pray now, God, that the prayers of the righteous availeth much in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Whatever has attached itself to him now. Be 
be removed now in the name of Jesus. We command his body to line up with the word of God. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, God. We bless you, God. Anoint his body, Father God. That he may walk in healing. That he may walk in wholeness. Ooh, Jesus. Ooh, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and minister. 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 Jehovah Rophi, come even right now. Bring healing to his body. Healing to his soul. Healing to his spirit, man. Refresh him, Lord God. Renew him. In the name of Jesus. God, revive him. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, and we bless you, Lord. We honor you, Father God. In the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you all can all stand. As we get prepared to close. Oh God, I just thank you. God is moving and he's shifting and he's he's doing some things. Minister Tom talked about fasting and I know I've mentioned it. Um, we're going to change the Wednesday fast for right now. We're going to prepare for a, a church-wide fast. I don't know what it looks like just yet because he hasn't given it all to me and I haven't even began to talk to pastor about it all. But it's going to be a, a fast. And it's going to require some things. A lot of us have been believing God. We've been seeking God individually. Some of you have shared with me. I've shared with you some of the things that God is wanting to do. We got to be ready. We got to be willing. I don't know what that, I don't know what that'll look like and we've had some experiences in this in this church and I know God is ready to do more but I believe he's waiting on us it's not that he's not moving because he's moving but I believe he's waiting on us belabor the time and I will probably spend some good time with Jesus today because this is a good word a powerful word thank you for your obedience to belabor I just want to say this I love y'all I'm talking about from the bottom of my shanana I love y'all with everything in me I don't think you understand what just your presence and what you do means 
sometimes when people drive up in the food pantry line, they say, well, I would not have eaten this week. My child wouldn't have gotten this or they wouldn't have got the pampers or they wouldn't have got whatever. Because you give and because you show up and you put stuff in baskets and you put stuff in this and you put stuff in that. Um, but we got to love. We got to continue to love. We got to continue to believe God for each other. We got to continue to forgive each other. We got to continue to open up our arms to each other and talk to each other. Because there is an anointing between all of us that when we are together, things are better. There's no way we could have done. And I got us in some more trouble because every, this week, I put it on our board at school. And I said, if you're hungry, I know a place where you can go and get a bag of grocery. I told my kids, I know a place where you can go get a shelf bag, a regular a produce bag, and a bag of meats. And I said, and you show up and you say, hey, we got a family. No question asked. They'll say, how many adults? How many kids? Pull up to the next line. And I said, and I know some of you may be embarrassed, but I'll act like I don't know you. Or we're just meeting for the first time. I said, it'd be one of the only lies I tell you. No, I don't like the lie. And I said, I'll act like I don't know you. And when you come back to school the next day, I never saw you in that line. And one of the kids, I saw his eyes open up. And I said, I didn't say anything, but I know he's coming. But it's because of what you do. It's because of you believing God. And I want to tell you this, and I'm not going to preach or take time out, but every one of you have an assignment. And I believe that there's assignments and there's alignments. And some of you individually may be like, what can I do? I don't feel like I have anything to offer. But one of the things that Minister Pringle was talking about in worship is worshiping God is just figuring out what it is I'm called to do and where it is I'm called to go. And all of it, you have an assignment from God. And I'm so glad to be a part of it. I'm so glad to be a part of it. I'm so glad to be a part of what God is doing in you and getting to watch you do what it is God called you to do. I'm so glad because you don't know what your act of obedience is doing. When they were standing out the other day and I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to get this out. When they were standing out the other day and they had the kids out there and they were teaching them how to play tennis and pickleball and I was, you don't know who can come out of that. Some little kid may have just taken an interest in tennis and you may see them at a U.S. Open a few years from now because you don't know what your one act of obedience, your one act of worship can do for somebody else. I'm a living witness. And so I just wanted to say, I didn't mean to get, but he got me a little emotional when he's talking about worship. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. No matter how big or how small you feel like what you're doing is, every act of obedience counts. Every act of love, every act of forgiveness. I didn't say we were going to all see things eye to eye. There may be sometimes when we irritate the snot out of each other. But you're my sister, you're my brother, and we love you. And we say we're going to always agree on every point. But that is what being in worship together looks like. Our song, our hymn, our spiritual song, our act of obedience, our act of love. And so I love you. And so. It is our duty to pray. And so I'm going to give it back to co-pastor so that she can pray and close us out. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Father, we just bless you, God. We honor you for today, Father God. We magnify you, Lord, because you are God and you are God alone. Lord, we thank you that there is none like you, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, for reminding us of our lifestyle of worship to you, Father God. Thank you, God, for reminding us not to take back the things that we've laid at the altar. Lord God, help us, Holy Spirit, to remember every time we keep picking up the things that are not like you and help us to set it down so that we may pick up the fruits of the Spirit, Father God. Help us to walk in the fruit of the Spirit this week, O oh God. Help us to talk according to your word this week, O oh God. Help us, Lord God, to live this week out, O oh God, blessing you and worshiping you with everything that we do, everything that we say, and everything, Lord God in our jobs and in our neighborhoods, oh God, and everywhere that we go. We bless your name, God. We honor you, Lord God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you and keep you and make he cause his face to shine upon you. Amen.